Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Christian Church. We're so glad that you have tuned in to this time of worship. Glad that you are with us. Let us know that you're here with us. You can do that in any number of ways. You can leave a comment. You can hit that like button. You can send us an email, a text, a letter, whatever you want to do to let us know that, uh, that you are, uh, are with us on Sunday and that, uh, that you're with us throughout the week as well. We have a number of announcements to share with folks. We, we are sad to receive the news that a uh, longtime uh, choir director from years and years ago of First Christian Church, Dorothy Sarver, died this past week. And so uh, we extend our deepest sympathies and condolences to the family and friends of Dorothy Sarver. And uh, we ask that you keep uh, all of them in your prayers as, uh, as they grieve this, uh, this loss. Uh, I believe calling hours for Dorothy are today from 2 to 4 at Newcomer, and then a uh, funeral service is tomorrow. I think you can find more information about uh, all of that online um, at the Beacon Journal. Some things going on in the life of the church. The youth group is going to be meeting again today, uh, right after church, around 11.30 until 1 o'clock this afternoon. We invite uh, all youth uh, that uh, are able and want to come out to youth group to do so. Bring a lunch with you. We will eat, uh, eat our sack lunches together outside, uh, and then uh, we're going to do a few things, including playing a fun game of human battleship. And so for those of you that want to see what that is, well, tune into Facebook or Twitter later on, and you'll see some pictures as well. And then later on this afternoon from 4 to 6 here at the church uh, is our Loaves and Fishes monthly free dinner. That is a carry-out drive-through. Uh, so if you uh, want to come by and grab some dinner, you can do that. You can help out. Uh, volunteers are always needed and appreciated, so if you got some time this afternoon to do that, uh, you can uh, come by for Loaves and Fishes from 4 to 6 here at the church. And then take note that next Sunday will be another installment of our church family fun night from 7 to 8 here at the church. We will be up at our Vesper spot uh, and in that uh, green space there just uh, to north of the parking lot. We're going to actually have several fires We're gonna have, uh, so that we can uh, have as many folks uh, as we can here, but uh, everybody can have some space around a fire. We invite you to bring a chair and anything that you'd like to roast over that fire. It's just going to be a time of fellowship around some fires next Sunday evening, 7 to 8, here at the church for another church family fun night. I hope you'll make plans to be a part of that. We are going to be putting together the October issue of the Pathways newsletter, so if you have any submissions that you would like to get in uh, to that uh, newsletter, please get those to the church office this week. And then uh, please take note, we uh, continue to uh, collect for the Stowe Bulldog bags, and we continue uh, to focus on our special collection uh, for Stowe Bulldog bags this, uh, this week. Uh, as we invite you to consider supporting Stow Bulldog Bags with a monetary gift given through the, the church, um, we are aiming to help them bridge the gap that has been created by churches not meeting in person as often. And so that is our aim uh, with the financial gift to the Stow Bulldog Bags. Hope that you'll consider how you can support, uh, support uh, giving to that good cause. Uh, as always, uh, on the church website is uh, today's bulletin with the uh, lyrics to all the hymns. Uh, the sermon is posted there. And uh, kiddos, today for our children's sermon, you're going to need the newspaper. If you got one sitting around, uh, a newspaper. I got today's Stowe Century available. So, uh, so go look for that uh, if you can. Uh, so have that uh, ready for our children's message. So a lot going on in the life of the church. More information about it all is in your bulletin as well as uh, the September Pathways. Check it out and see how you can be a part of things. But now let us, let us focus on being a part of this time of worship and let us do that through our prelude. <laughs>
Pastor Jim Tomberlin said, we have made Christianity a building-centric faith. But buildings don't reach people. People reach people. I appreciated that quote this week because as we continue on in this COVID season where we are not meeting in person like we want to and like we normally would, it is important for us to remember that buildings don't reach people, but people reach people. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Throughout this COVID season, the church has never closed. We have remained open the entire time. We may not be coming to our building like we want to, but the church is each one of us. And the church is always open. And the church is always to be sharing the love of Christ to everyone. When we worship, we prepare ourselves to be the church. So let us focus on this time of worship. Let us open ourselves up to God's presence and let us know that we are being prepared here and now, wherever it is that we are, to be the church later today and throughout the entire week. So let us prepare to be the church. And let us do so as we worship and let us continue to worship as we sing together. Come Christians, join to sing. Let us worship. Christians join to sing Alleluia Amen Loud praise to Christ we bring Alleluia Amen Let all with heart and voice Before his throne rejoice Praise we with grateful choice Alleluia, amen. Come, lift your hearts on high. Alleluia, amen. Let praises fill the sky. Alleluia, amen. Christ is our guide and friend on whom we can depend his love shall never end alleluia amen praise yet our christ again alleluia amen life shall not end the strain Alleluia, amen. On heaven's blissful shore, his goodness will adore, singing forevermore. Alleluia, amen. You know, for those of you who don't know, that hymn uh, shares the tune with the Ohio State University alma mater, so I'm always, I'm always excited to see that in the bulletin. Was that, was that intentional this week because we got news that uh, we're going to have Big Ten football after all? It was a coincidence. Well, yeah, it, it wasn't a coincidence. It was divine intervention is what it was. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather this morning, to join together in worship, we lift up our voices in praise and thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, for the wonder of your creation. May we never fail to appreciate its beauty. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Help us to make the most of it and to make the most of every day. You have seen fit to bless us so profusely. Let us be thankful that we live in a time and place of abundance. At the same time, Lord, we are ever mindful that not all of your children share in this abundance. Even as we are thankful for our blessings, 
help us to show compassion and empathy for the least among us. We know that in this fallen and broken world, there will always be pain and suffering. May we then be your instruments of relief and healing. These things we pray, amen. <clears throat> Yesterday, <clears throat> my family attended a Catholic funeral mass. Now, with my mother's side of the family being Catholic, I've attended mass before, so the more ritualistic parts of their service weren't anything new to me. But this was the first time my children had attended a Catholic church service. So I'm not going to forget anytime soon the look of bewilderment on their faces uh, when the priest offered a prayer to start the service and everyone in unison and with the precision of a drill team made the sign of the cross at the conclusion of his prayer. They, uh, the kids looked at me and Rochelle like, uh, hey, uh, should we be doing this too? We quietly told them that they were fine, but this was their first hint that this wasn't going to be a church service quite like what they were used to. Though I don't think their minds were really blown until the priest swung the censer with uh, burning incense in it at the conclusion of the service. <laughs> People gather together in worship in all sorts of different ways, but we can all come together in Christian fellowship with the recognition that we are called on to love each other because Jesus first loved us. So let's be mindful of that this week as we greet the people in our communities and share with them the peace of Christ. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender. Savior, I surrender i 
Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Andrea. Beautiful piece. Beautiful. All right, kiddos, gather around. Do you have your newspaper handy? Well, if you do, then I invite you to turn into the newspaper that have, you have there to the section that's called the, the classifieds. The classified sections. It looks like this. There's no pictures, generally. But this is the classified section, and in the classified section, you find all kinds of listings that people have put in there, listings for things that maybe they're selling, but a lot of the classified, or what they call the want ads sometimes, are job listings. Now, we don't see them as much anymore in newspapers. We see job postings online more so, but you still can find some some job postings in the newspaper, like looking through <laughs> today's uh, Stowe Century, there's, there's some uh, help wanted computer and IT training programming. Train online to get skills to become a computer and help desk professional now, right? So help wanted, earn your hospitality degree on here, right? There's, there's help wanted for, uh, for home health care aides, uh, for, uh, for all kinds of manners, of th for electricians, for engineers, uh, for people to do home remodeling. There's all kinds of help wanted ads. Now, now you guys will tell me if you hear any of your parents mumbling under their breath that that preacher needs to be checking out the want ads there. But anyway, so, so the want ads, you can find, find a job in the want ads. And this makes me wonder a little bit. We all have taken on the job of being followers of Jesus. So what skills do we need to have in order to do good works, good work as followers of Jesus? Because the want ads tell you what kind of experience that you need to do a job, right? So if you are going to, if they're looking for a handyman, that handyman or handy person might need uh, some experience in doing, uh, doing that kind of work. Or an engineer would need some, some education and some uh, experience in doing that kind of work. Well, there's a man who was a follower of Jesus who I've talked with you about before. His name was the Apostle Paul, and he wrote a lot of the New Testament of the Bible. And he reminds us of what Jesus taught. Jesus taught, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in order to do this job, we need to know who our neighbor is, of course. Is our neighbor the person who lives next door to us or across the street from us? Well, of course that's our neighbor. But is that the only person who is our neighbor, the people on, on either side of us or on the other side of the street? Of course not. Our neighbor is everyone, right? And so to do our job as the as followers of Jesus, we are called to love everyone. Now, is this an easy job? Absolutely not. It's a really, really hard job. But you know what? Anything worth doing is usually hard to do. But God gets that this is a hard job. And God knows we won't always do this job perfectly. But God promises to never, ever fire us from doing this job. And God promises to always keep training us for the job by loving us the way we are to love others, with compassion and grace, with mercy and forgiveness. So let's all know our job as followers of Jesus. And that's to always love. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us love others as you love us. Amen. Thanks.
The concept of stewardship is a very old one in our tradition. Indeed, in the creation story, consider that when God put Adam in the Garden of Eden, it was to tend to the garden. And when he made Eve, it, it was not just to be Adam's companion, but also his helper. I don't know about you, but when I think of Adam and Eve, I tend to think of them as lounging around in paradise without much of a care. Instead, they were given a job to do, the job of being good stewards to God's creation. And so it is with us. Our job might not be to tend to the Garden of Eden, but as part of this congregation, we can do our part to be good stewards of God's creation nonetheless. We gratefully accept your gifts, tithes, and offerings through the mail or through the secure online giving page linked to from the church's website. than silver, Lord, you are more costly than gold, Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we humbly offer these gifts to you and ask you to bless them. We pray for the discernment needed to ensure that this offering is put to the best possible use. May we be effective stewards of these gifts so that we can use them to be effective stewards of your creation. Amen. <laughs> Like last week, God's word for us comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. Last week we were in chapter 12. This week we move ahead to chapter 13, verses 8 to 14. This is, of course, Paul writing to a new church in Rome. Church that's, well, it's a church that, like us, just always trying to figure out what it is God is calling us to do. And this is Paul talking to them about that one great commandment. Paul writes, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is Far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The COVID-19 health crisis around the world has taught us all a lot of lessons and has made a lot of revelations. For instance, 
While I knew the job and calling of teachers was a hard one, I didn't know just how hard it was until I tried to homeschool my kids. Last spring, I had serious doubts about passing the second grade, and just three weeks into the third grade, those doubts have only compounded exponentially. So for today's sermon, I thought, since I've had to go back to school, well, we all get to go back to school. Don't worry, we will skip the terrifying trips to the chalkboard and the awkwardness of co-ed gym class. But if you Gen Xers out there want to uh, get out your jelly shoes and your jean jackets, your flannel and your Nirvana t-shirts, well, feel free. School can be hard at any grade level for all manners of social and institutional constructs, but school doesn't do itself any favors when it tries to employ teaching methods that make learning harder than it needs to be. I'm not talking about teachers who teach, but rather the tools they are given to do the teaching, namely textbooks. Ask students and teachers, and many will tell you that some textbooks were written by those who were neither teachers nor apparently students, agreeing that textbooks can too often contain some of the most baffling, boring, mundane, and sometimes utterly senseless instruction that you've ever read. Unclear, nonsensical, and blooperish questions have been appearing in textbooks for generations, which could explain that C- minus that you got in Mr. Rosenzweig's geometry class. I told you, Mom, it wasn't my fault. The question was, find X, show your work. So I did. X was right there in the corner of the triangle. I drew a, an arrow and a line from X to the question to show my work. Mr. Rosenzweig didn't even give me partial credit, although he was probably generous with that C-. minus. A website called Thanks Textbooks now offers a fascinating look at the myriad of ways in which educational writing can make students actually more confused than proficient. The site lists dozens of textbooks, fails, and head scratchers from around the world, enough to make even the most challenged student feel like a genius by comparison. Here are some examples from actual textbooks. A local hamburger outlet offers patrons a choice of four condiments, catsup, mustard, pickles, and onions. If the condiments are added or omitted in random fashion, what is the probability you will get one of the following types, catsup and onion, mustard and pickles, or one with everything? Thank goodness this textbook writer hadn't been to a Five Guys burger joint that offers 15 burger toppings. Here's another one. Frank ate 12 pieces of pizza, and Dave ate 15 pieces. I ate a fourth more, said Dave. I ate a fifth less, said Frank. Who was right? I think the real question here is, with that kind of pizza consumption, who has the higher cholesterol? <laughs> then there is Susie and Carl, who are playing ga a game with complex numbers. If Susie has a score of 5 minus 4i, and Carl has a score of 3 plus 2i, what is their total score? I have no idea. But I do know Susie and Carl need to get a more fun game to play. I don't know, maybe try Candyland or Shoots and Ladders, Susie and Carl. Give it a try. It's almost as though these textbooks were written by... It's almost as though these textbooks' writers live in a different world than the rest of us. A world where someone orders random condiments on their burger, where eating 27 pieces of pizza is normal, and where the goal of childhood games is to have as little fun as possible. 
There's no wonder students look at this stuff and exclaim, I'll never use this. You may not remember the last time you played a game with complex numbers, if ever. But still, there are certain pieces, of course, of our educational upbringing that are both useful and necessary to our daily life. This is especially true when it comes to the Christian life, for which we need clear directions with practical applications in order to manage real-world problems. Fortunately for us, the Apostle Paul gives us his letter to the Romans, which could be considered a textbook for the Christian life. But Paul wasn't simply dreaming up problems for his churches to solve. In fact, Paul often answered questions the world didn't know they needed to ask. Now, Romans itself isn't the easiest book to read and understand with its paragraph-long sentences and lengthy arguments, but it offers some of the most practical and useful advice for living in a world where things often don't make sense. And this is the case in our text for today. The clarity of Paul's instruction here in chapter 13 offers the answer key to a whole lot of problems of living the life of Christ in the world. And we would be doing the faithful thing to learn all we can from this textbook of Christianity. For Paul, as it was for Jesus, the primary answer to any problem one might encounter is love. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves has fulfilled the law. The law, Paul points to here, is the commandments found in Exodus. Ten clear statements about the way life is to be lived in the community of God's people. But like any word problem, staring at these commandments for a long period of time can lead to looking for loopholes or alternative, alternative interpretations, i.e. find X. There it is. That's why Paul reveals the basis behind the commandments as the guiding principle for answering most every question and every test the Christian might encounter. The commandments are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul echoes Jesus here, who preached that the greatest commandments are the love of God and the love of neighbor. On these two commandments, said Jesus, hang all the laws and the prophets. Whatever the question might be for Christian behavior, be it about eating, playing games, relationships, engagement with the world, about being the church, or even trying to figure out who's to blame for a poor grade in geometry. The answer is love. Of course, that's not an easy answer. And we are all often staring at a generous C- minus in loving our neighbor. Or worse, when Jesus tells us to love even our enemy. It's important to remember Paul is writing to the church in Rome, which is struggling under the thumb of the emperor. Its people are in a tough place who's, where those outside this worldview see the church as enemy at worst and at best as an institution that is irrelevant. As a result, the Roman world would be hostile to Christians for some 300 years. But even then, Paul says the answer to the questions on this civic test is love and respect. 
even when confronted with the power and injustice of the world against them, the Christian's answer must always be love. Now this isn't, though, a squishy, meek kind of love Paul is calling for. No, nor is it a quantitative one like another textbook question that asks, the ratio of hugs to kisses at the family reunion was four to one. If there were 148 hugs, how many kisses were there? Well, there were 37, but way less if Aunt Gertrude forgot her teeth. Rather, the kind of love Paul is talking about is the love that forgives rather than retaliates, that promotes peace, instead of conflict, that bridges differences instead of making a wider gap. In fact, Paul says we need this shorthand answer of love for most questions because time is running out. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, For salvation is nearer to us than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Like a student watching the clock while taking the SAT, Paul sees that time is nearly up for the present world. The day of the Lord, the eschaton, is close at hand. The day when every person will be called to account for their deeds. Paul is instructing us to stop deconstructing the question and get busy showing our work. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. In other words, Live now as though you've already passed the test. Students who envision themselves being successful and who put extra time into study tend not to be surprised when odd or anomalous questions appear on a test. Paul invites us to likewise engage in good habits that lead to success in contrast to those who are lazy and licentious, who will flunk the ultimate final. This is Paul's textbook advice to those of us who are confronted with strange questions and hard situations every day. What's the right answer when your boss treats you unfairly What's the proper response when your friend gets the scholarship you thought you deserved? How do you be a neighbor to a neighbor who has a political sign that differs from yours in their front yard? What do you do about the fact that there are some people who you don't like and some people who don't like you? How do you respond to a problem with one of your family members? What do you do when your character is misjudged? What do you do when you are in a tough place and those around you come at you as your enemy? The broader answer is never easy. But the answer always begins with love. Unconditional, willful, sacrificial Christ-like love. Start there, and the rest of the answer becomes much clearer. So let us, lo- let us let love be the answer to all the tests of life. And let us use our lives to show our work. Because when it comes to the tests of life, love is textbook Christianity. Amen. Friends, let us join together and go to God again through our prayers. Let us pray.
Holy God, we come to you this day aware we are in times of dimness, a nighttime where pain, anguish, and fear run rampant, and the worry the night will never end sets ever deeper into the minds, hearts, and spirits of so many of your children. We have only to think about the ongoing global health crisis with its rising and dropping of numbers and statistics, its differing messages from those who are relaying information, all of it splitting our understanding of what's really happening. We have only to think about the ongoing effects and devastating impacts of Hurricane Sally and the people who've had to first endure its power and now have to sort through its destruction. We have only to think about this political season and the divisive unrest it contains, along with the vicious attacks from all sides, both verbal and physical. We have only to think of the civil unrest and the conflict between those fighting to be heard and those who don't want to hear. Holy God, we know the answer to each of these dim and cold situations and so many others. The answer is your love. Your love available to all. Your love that we know has been instilled in each of us in your church. This is what the world needs. So we pray you help us to share it in every way we possibly can. Through your love that we share, may there be no more gloom for those who are in anguish. Through your love that we share, may you lift away people's burdens. Through your love that we share, may you remove that which oppresses the lives of so many of your children. Through your love that we share, may you give courage to those who are lost and consumed with fear. Lord God, your love calls us forth to follow and serve you. Your love shines for all to see in this world. May we reflect your love in our lives, in our service, in our words, and in our deeds. And now the prayers deep within our hearts as we offer them to you in this time of holy silence. All this we pray in the name of the one who showed us how to love, Jesus the Christ, who taught us also to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let's gather together our elements as we gather together around our Lord's table to share with one another in God's holy communion. Our communion hymn this morning is probably one that's not familiar to most of you. Um, it's not a very difficult melody at all to sing. Uh, Andrea is going to play it all the way through, and if you would like to just wait while I sing one or two verses before you join in, um, that would be fine. Uh, Andrea? <laughs> upon your table, Lord, the food of life, the bread and wine, as symbols of our daily work, according to your grand design. 
Within these simple things there lie the height and depth of human life. Our pain and tears, our thoughts and toils, our hopes and fears, our joy and strife. Accept them, Lord, they come from you. We take them humbly from your hand. These gifts of yours for higher use we offer up as you command. I like Paul's words in our text for today where he says, besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. It's a big term these days for us to wake up, for us to be woke. Well, every time we come to this table, it is an opportunity for us to wake up, to become woke again to what this table and these elements hold for all who come to it. For here at this table we come to partake of this bread and this cup, but they are elements that become the very bread of life and the cup of salvation. They are elements that remind us that we have been forgiven and reconciled. They are elements that remind us we are loved unconditionally. And we are woke to the message that we are to go forth from this table as those who have been forgiven and reconciled, as those who are loved unconditionally, and to share that with others. So let us come to this table. Let us come aware of what it is that we need, that we need to again be forgiven and reconciled, that we need again to remember we are loved unconditionally. But then let us take these elements into our bodies, into our spirits, and let them rise up in us so that we go forth ready to show our work of love and reconciliation to all. For it was on that night before Jesus was crucified when he gathered with his disciples and shared with them a meal. It was during that meal he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and eat of this, all of you. For this bread represents my broken body, broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, Jesus took a cup and he gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and drink from this, all of you. For this cup represents my shed blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sin. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Let us come to this table, friends. Let us receive these gifts, for they are the gifts of God, for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord God, bless this bread and wine. May the act of taking communion this morning inspire us. Let us resolve to dedicate ourselves to be your humble servant and to watch more closely than you. Amen. Jesus is always inviting us to follow him. So let us all hear again and consider that invitation. How will we respond? How will we respond to Jesus' invitation to follow him, live like him, and love like him?
Let us consider how, as we join together in singing our hymn of invitation, number 602, O Master, let me walk with thee. Let us sing. since I took geometry in school. But it wasn't Mr. Rosenzweig's fault. In fact, I have only myself to blame for that very generous C- minus that he gave to me in geometry class. But what Mr. Rosenzweig and so many others were doing was teaching me to think, teaching me to, to build up my foundation of who I was becoming. And that is what Paul is always calling us to do. No, we're not always going to get it right. We're often going to get that generous C- in how we walk with Christ. But that's not the point. The point is, is that we keep doing it. That we keep trying to get better. We keep trying to Make it part of our lives. So let us go forth ready to continue to show our work in walking with Christ. Because when we do, someone will notice it. And someone will want to know more about it. And that's when we can show more of our work. By sharing with them who it is that helped us to find this way of life. And inviting them to find it for their life too. Maybe right here some Sunday morning. So as you go forth to do the work and to show your work of being a follower of Christ, may the grace of God, the constant and abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, and the unconditional love of Jesus Christ rest and abide with every one of you, now and forevermore. Amen.
and dismiss us with your blessing. Fill our hearts with joy and peace. Let us each your love possessing. Triumph in redeeming grace. Oh, refresh us, oh, refresh us, traveling through this wilderness. Thanks we give and adoration for your gospel's joyful sound. May the fruits of your salvation in our hearts and lives abound. Ever faithful, ever faithful to the truth may we